Section 19 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 1, by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Section 19. The Repeal of the Missouri Compromise. The long contest in Congress over the compromise measures of 1850, and the reluctance of a minority, alike in the North and the South, to accept them, had in reality seriously demoralized both the great political parties of the country. The Democrats especially, defeated by the fresh military laurels of General Taylor in 1848, were much exercised to discover their most available candidate as the presidential election of 1852 approached. The leading names, Cass, Buchanan, and Marcy, having been long before the public, were becoming a little stale. In this contingency, a considerable following grouped itself about an entirely new man, Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois. Emigrating from Vermont to the West, Douglas had run a career remarkable for political success. Only in his thirty-ninth year, he had served as member of the legislature, as state's attorney, as secretary of state, and as judge of the Supreme Court in Illinois, and had since been three times elected to Congress and once to the Senate of the United States. Nor did he owe his political fortunes entirely to accident. Among his many qualities of leadership were strong physical endurance, untiring industry, a persistent boldness, a ready facility in public speaking, unfailing political shrewdness, an unusual power in running debate, with liberal instincts and progressive purposes. It was therefore not surprising that he should attract the admiration and support of the young, the ardent, and especially the restless and ambitious members of his party. His career in Congress was sufficiently conspicuous. As chairman of the Committee on Territories in the Senate, he had borne a prominent part in the enactment of the Compromise Measures of 1850, and had just met and overcome a threatened party schism in his own state, which that legislation had there produced. In their eagerness to push his claims to the presidency, the partisans of Douglas committed a great error. Rightly appreciating the growing power of the press, they obtained control of the Democratic Review, a monthly magazine then prominent as a party organ, and published in it a series of articles attacking the rival Democratic candidates in very flashy rhetoric. These were stigmatized as old fogies, who must give ground to a nominee of Young America. They were reminded that the party expects a new man. Age is to be honored, but senility is pitiable. Statesmen of a previous generation must get out of the way. The Democratic Party was owned by a set of old clothes horses. They couldn't pay their political promises in four Democratic administrations, and the names of Cass and Marcy, Buchanan and Butler, were freely mixed in with such epithets as pretenders, hucksters, intruders, and vile charlatans. Such characterization of such men soon created a flagrant scandal in the Democratic Party, which was duly aired both in the newspapers and in Congress. It definitely fixed the phrases Old Fogey and Young America in our slang literature. The personal friends of Douglas hastened to explain and assert his innocence of any complicity with this political raid, but they were not more than half-believed and the war of factions, begun in January, raged with increasing bitterness till the Democratic National Convention met at Baltimore in June, and undoubtedly exerted a decisive influence over the deliberations of that body. The only serious competitors for the nomination were the old fogies Cass, Marcy, and Buchanan, on the one hand, and Douglas, the pet of young America, on the other. It soon became evident that opinion was so divided among these four that a nomination could only be reached through long and tedious ballotings. Beginning with some twenty votes, Douglas steadily gained adherence till, on the thirtieth ballot, he received ninety-two. From this point, however, his strength fell away. 
unable himself to succeed he was nevertheless sufficiently powerful to defeat his adversaries the exasperation had been too great to permit a concentration or compromise on any of the seniors cass reached only one hundred thirty one votes marcy ninety eight buchanan one hundred four and finally on the forty ninth ballot occurred the memorable nearly unanimous selection of franklin pierce not because of any merit of his own but to break the insurmountable deadlock of factional hatred young america gained a nominal triumph old fogydom a real revenge and the south a serviceable northern ally douglas and his friends were discomfited but not dismayed their management had been exceedingly maladroit as a more modest championship would without doubt have secured him the coveted nomination yet sagacious politicians foresaw that on the whole he was strengthened by his defeat from that time forward he was a recognized presidential aspirant and competitor young enough patiently to bide his time and of sufficient prestige to make his flag the rallying point of all the freelances in the democratic party it is to this presidential aspiration of mr douglas that we must look as the explanation of his agency in bringing about the repeal of the missouri compromise as already said after some factious opposition the measures of eighteen fifty had been accepted by the people as a finality of the slavery question around this alleged settlement distasteful as it was to many public opinion gradually crystallized both the national conventions of eighteen fifty two solemnly resolved that they would discountenance and resist in congress or out of it whenever wherever or however or under whatever color or shape any further renewal of the slavery agitation this determination was echoed and re-echoed affirmed and reaffirmed by the recognized organs of the public voice from the village newspaper to the presidential message from the country debating school to the measured utterances of senatorial discussion in support of this alleged finality no one had taken a more decided stand than senator douglas himself said he quote, in taking leave of this subject i wish to state that i have determined never to make another speech upon the slavery question and i will now add the hope that the necessity for it will never exist so long as our opponents do not agitate for repeal or modification why should we agitate for any purpose we claim that the compromise of eighteen fifty is a final settlement is a final settlement open to discussion and agitation and controversy by its friends what manner of settlement is that which does not settle the difficulty and quiet the dispute are not the friends of the compromise becoming the agitators and will not the country hold us responsible for that which we condemn and denounce in the abolitionists and free soldiers these are matters worthy of our consideration those who preach peace should not be the first to commence and reopen an old quarrel Unquote. in his senate speeches during the compromise debates of eighteen fifty while generally advocating his theory of non-intervention he had sounded the whole gamut of the slavery discussion defending the various measures of adjustment against the attacks of the southern extremists and specifically defending the missouri compromise more than this he had declared in distinct words that the principle of territorial prohibition was no violation of southern rights and denounced the proposition of calhoun to put a balance of power clause into the constitution as quote, a retrograde movement in an age of progress that would astonish the world unquote. these repeated affirmations taken in connection with his famous description of the missouri compromise in eighteen forty nine in which he declared it to have had quote, an origin akin to the constitution unquote, and to have become quote, canonized in the hearts of the american people as a sacred thing which no ruthless hand would ever be reckless enough to disturb unquote, all seemed in the public mind to fix his position definitely no one imagined that douglas would so soon become the subject of his own anathemas the full personal details of this event are lost to history 
we have only a faint and shadowy outline of isolated movements of a few chief actors a few vague suggestions and fragmentary steps in the formation and unfolding of the ill-omened plot as the avowed representative of the restless and ambitious elements of the country as the champion of young america douglas had so far as possible in his congressional career made himself the apostle of modern progress he was a believer in manifest destiny and a zealous advocate of the monroe doctrine he desired so the newspapers averred that the caribbean sea should be declared an american lake and nothing so delighted him as to pull the beard of the british lion these topics while they furnished themes for campaign speeches for the present led to no practical legislation in his position as chairman of the senate committee on territories however he had control of kindred measures of present and vital interest to the people of the west namely the opening of new routes of travel and immigration and of new territories for settlement an era of wonder had just dawned connecting itself directly with these subjects the acquisition of california and the discovery of gold had turned the eyes of the whole civilized world to the pacific coast plains and mountains were swarming with adventurers and emigrants oregon utah new mexico and minnesota had just been organized and were in a feeble way contesting the sudden fame of the golden state the western border was astir and wild visions of lands and cities and mines and wealth and power were disturbing the dreams of the pioneer in his frontier cabin and hurrying him off on the long romantic quest across the continent hitherto stringent federal laws had kept settlers and unlicensed traders out of the indian territory which lay beyond the western boundaries of arkansas missouri and iowa and which the policy of our early presidents fixed upon as the final asylum of the red men retreating before the advance of white settlements but now the uncontrollable stream of emigration had broken into and through this reservation creating in a few years well-defined routes of travel to new mexico utah california and oregon though from the long march there came constant cries of danger and distress of starvation and indian massacre there was neither halting nor delay the courageous pioneers pressed forward all the more earnestly and to such purpose that in less than twenty-five years the pacific railroad followed fremont's first exploration through the south pass douglas himself a migratory child of fortune was in thorough sympathy with the somewhat premature western longing of the people and as chairman of the committee on territories was the recipient of all the letters petitions and personal solicitations from the various interests which were seeking their advantage in this exodus toward the setting sun he was the natural center for all the embryo mail contractors office holders indian traders land sharks and railroad visionaries whose coveted opportunities lay in the western territories it is but just to his fame however to say that he comprehended equally well the true philosophical and political necessities which now demanded the opening of kansas and nebraska as a secure highway and protecting bridge to the rocky mountains and our new-found el dorado no less than as a bond of union between the older states and the improvised young america on the pacific coast the subject was not yet ripe for action during the stormy politics of eighteen fifty to eighteen fifty one and had again to be postponed for the presidential campaign of eighteen fifty two but after pierce was triumphantly elected with a democratic congress to sustain him the legislative calm which both parties had adjured in their platforms seemed favorable for pushing measures of local interest the control of legislation for the territories was for the moment completely in the hands of douglas he was himself chairman for the committee of the senate and his special personal friend and political lieutenant in his own state william a richardson of illinois was chairman of the territorial committee of the house he could therefore choose his own time and mode of introducing measures of this character in either house of congress under the majority control of his party a fact to be constantly borne in mind when we consider the origin and progress of the three nebraska bills 
the journal discloses that richardson of illinois chairman of the committee on territories of the house of representatives on february second eighteen fifty three introduced into the house quote, a bill to organize the territory of nebraska unquote. after due reference and some desultory debate on the eighth it was taken up and passed by the house on the tenth from the discussion we learn that the boundaries were the missouri river on the east the rocky mountains on the west the line of thirty six degrees thirty or southern line of missouri on the south and the line of forty three degrees or near the northern line of iowa on the north several members opposed it because the indian title to the lands was not yet extinguished and because it embraced reservations pledged to indian occupancy in perpetuity also on the general ground that it contained but few white inhabitants and its organization was therefore a useless expense howard of texas made the most strenuous opposition urging that since it contained but about six hundred souls its southern boundary should be fixed at thirty nine degrees thirty not to trench upon the indian reservations hall of missouri replied in support of the bill quote, we want the organization of the territory of nebraska not merely for the protection of the few people who reside there but also for the protection of oregon and california in time of war and the protection of our commerce and the fifty or sixty thousand emigrants who annually cross the plains unquote. he added that its limits were purposely made large to embrace the great lines of travel to oregon new mexico and california since the south pass was in forty two degrees thirty the territory had to extend to forty three degrees north the incident however of special historical significance had occurred in the debate of the eighth when a member rose and said quote, i wish to inquire of the gentleman from ohio mr giddings who i believe is a member of the committee on territories why the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven is not incorporated in this bill i should like to know whether he or the committee were intimidated on account of the platforms of eighteen fifty two to which mr giddings replied that the south line of the territory was thirty six degrees thirty and was already covered by the missouri compromise prohibition quote, this law stands perpetually and i do not think that this act would receive any increased validity by a reenactment there i leave the matter it is very clear that the territory included in this treaty ceding louisiana must be forever free unless the law be repealed unquote. with this explicit understanding from a member of the committee apparently accepted as conclusive by the whole house and certainly not objected to by the chairman mr richardson who was carefully watching the current of debate the bill passed on the tenth ninety-eight yeas to forty-three nays led by a few members from that region in the main the west voted for it and the south against it while the greater number absorbed in other schemes were wholly indifferent and probably cast their votes upon personal solicitation on the following day the bill was hurried over to the senate referred to mr douglas's committee and by him reported back without amendment on february seventeenth but the session was almost ended before he was able to gain the attention of the senate for its discussion finally on the night before the inauguration of president pierce in the midst of a fierce and protracted struggle over the appropriation bills while the senate was without a quorum and impatiently awaiting the reports of a number of conference committees douglas seized the opportunity of the lull to call up his nebraska bill here again as in the house texas stubbornly opposed it houston undertook to talk it to death in a long speech bell protested against robbing the indians of their guaranteed rights the bill seemed to have no friend but its author when perhaps to his surprise senator d r atchison of missouri threw himself into the breach prefacing his remarks with the statement that he had formerly been opposed to the measure he continued quote, i had two objections to it 
one was that the indian title in that territory had not been extinguished or at least a very small portion of it had been another was the missouri compromise or as it is commonly called the slavery restriction it was my opinion at that time and i am not now very clear on that subject that the law of congress when the state of missouri was admitted into the union excluding slavery from the territory of louisiana north of thirty six degrees thirty would be enforced in that territory unless it was specially rescinded and whether that law was in accordance with the constitution of the united states or not it would do its work and that work would be to preclude slaveholders from going into that territory but when i came to look into that question i found that there was no prospect no hope of a repeal of the missouri compromise excluding slavery from that territory i have always been of opinion that the first great error committed in the political history of this country was the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven rendering the northwest territory free territory the next great error was the missouri compromise but they are both irremediable we must submit to them i am prepared to do it it is evident that the missouri compromise cannot be repealed so far as that question is concerned we might as well agree to the admission of this territory now as next year or five or ten years hence unquote. mr douglas closed the debate advocating the passage of the bill for general reasons and by his silence accepting atchison's conclusions but as the morning of the fourth of march was breaking an unwilling senate laid the bill on the table by a vote of twenty-three to seventeen here as in the house the west being for and the south against the measure it is not probable however that in this course the south acted with any mental reservation or sinister motive the great breach of faith was not yet even meditated only a few hours afterwards in a dignified and stately national ceremonial in the midst of foreign ministers judges senators and representatives the new president of the united states delivered to the people his inaugural address high and low were alike intent to discern the opening political currents of the new administration but none touched or approached this particular subject the aspirations of young america were not towards a conquest of the north but the enlargement of the south a freshening breeze filled the sails of annexation and manifest destiny in bold words the president said quote, the policy of my administration will not be controlled by any timid forebodings of evil from expansion indeed it is not to be disguised that our attitude as a nation and our position on the globe render the acquisition of certain possessions not within our jurisdiction eminently important for our protection if not in the future essential for the preservation of the rights of commerce and the peace of the world unquote. reaching the slavery question he expressed unbounded devotion to the union and declared slavery recognized by the constitution and his purpose to enforce the compromise measures of eighteen fifty adding quote, i fervently trust that the question is at rest and that no sectional or ambitious or fanatical excitement may again threaten the durability of our institutions or obscure the light of our prosperity when congress met again in the following december 1853 the annual message of president pierce was upon this subject but an echo of his inaugural as his inaugural had been but an echo of the two party platforms of 1852 affirming that the compromise measures of 1850 had given repose to the country he declared quote, that this repose is to suffer no shock during my official term if i have the power to avert it those who placed me here may be assured unquote. in this spirit undoubtedly the democratic party and the south began the session of eighteen fifty three to eighteen fifty four but unfortunately it was very soon abandoned the people of the missouri and iowa border were becoming every day more impatient to enter upon an authorized occupancy of the new lands 
which lay a day's journey to the west handfuls of squatters here and there had elected two territorial delegates who hastened to washington with embryo credentials the subject of organizing the west was again broached an iowa senator introduced a territorial bill under the ordinary routine it was referred to the committee on territories and on the fourth day of january douglas reported back his second nebraska bill still without any repeal of the missouri compromise his elaborate report accompanying this second bill shows that the subject had been most carefully examined in committee the discussion was evidently exhaustive going over the whole history policy and constitutionality of prohibitory legislation two or three sentences are quite sufficient to present the substance of the long and wordy report first that there were differences and doubts second that these had been finally settled by the compromise measures of eighteen fifty and therefore third the committee had adhered not only to the spirit but to the very phraseology of that adjustment and refused either to affirm or repeal the missouri compromise this was the public and legislative agreement announced to the country subsequent revelations show the secret and factional bargain which that agreement covered not only was this territorial bill searchingly considered in committee but repeated caucuses were held by the democratic leaders to discuss the party results likely to grow out of it the southern democrats maintained that the constitution of the united states recognized their right and guaranteed them protection to their slave property if they chose to carry it into federal territories douglas and other northern democrats contended that slavery was subject to local law and that the people of a territory like those of a state could establish or prohibit it this radical difference if carried into party action would lose them the political ascendancy they had so long maintained and were then enjoying to avert a public rupture of the party it was agreed quote, that the territories should be organized with a delegation by congress of all the power of congress in the territories and that the extent of the power of congress should be determined by the courts unquote. if the courts should decide against the south the southern democrats would accept the northern theory if the courts should decide in favor of the south the northern democrats would defend the southern view thus harmony would be preserved and party power prolonged here we have the shadow of the coming dred scott decision already projected into political history though the speaker protests that quote, none of us knew of the existence of a controversy then pending in the federal courts that would lead almost immediately to the decision of that question unquote. this was probably true for a peculiar provision was expressly inserted in the committee's bill allowing appeals to the supreme court of the united states in all questions involving title to slaves without reference to the usual limitations in respect to the value of the property thereby paving the way to an early adjudication by the supreme court thus the matter rested till the sixteenth of january when senator dixon of kentucky apparently acting for himself alone offered an amendment in effect repealing the missouri compromise upon this provocation senator sumner of massachusetts the next day offered another amendment affirming that it was not repealed by the bill commenting on these propositions two days later the administration organ the washington union declared they were both false lights to be avoided by all good democrats by this time however the subject of repeal had become bruited about the capitol corridors the hotels and the caucus rooms of washington and newspaper correspondents were on the qui vive to obtain the latest developments concerning the intrigue the secrets of the territorial committee leaked out and consultations multiplied could a repeal be carried who would offer it and lead it what divisions or schisms would it carry into the ranks of the democratic party especially in the pending contest between the hards and softs in new york what effect would it have upon the presidential election of eighteen fifty six already the union suggested that it was whispered that cass was willing to propose and favor such a repeal it was given out in the baltimore sun 
that cass intended to separate the sheep from the goats both statements were untrue but they perhaps had their intended effect to arouse the jealousy and eagerness of douglas the political air of washington was heavy with clouds and mutterings and clans were gathering for and against the ominous proposition so far as history has been allowed a glimpse into these secret communings three principal personages were at this time planning a movement of vast portent these were stephen a douglas chairman of the senate committee on territories archibald dixon whig senator from kentucky and david r atchison of missouri then president pro tempore of the senate and acting vice president of the united states Quote, for myself said the latter in explaining the transaction i am entirely devoted to the interest of the south and i would sacrifice everything but my hope of heaven to advance her welfare he thought the missouri compromise ought to be repealed he had pledged himself in his public addresses to vote for no territorial organization that would not virtually annul it and with this feeling in his heart he desired to be the chairman of the senate committee on territories when a bill was introduced with this object in view he had a private interview with mr douglas and informed him of what he desired the introduction of a bill for nebraska like what he had promised to vote for and that he would like to be the chairman of the committee on territories in order to introduce such a measure and if he could get that position he would immediately resign as president of the senate judge douglas requested twenty-four hours to consider the matter and if at the expiration of that time he could not introduce such a bill as he mr atchison proposed he would resign as chairman of the territorial committee in democratic caucus and exert his influence to get him atchison appointed at the expiration of the given time senator douglas signified his intention to introduce such a bill as had been spoken of footnote speech at atchison city september eighteen fifty four reported in the parkville luminary End footnote. senator dixon is no less explicit in his description of these political negotiations Quote, my amendment seemed to take the senate by surprise and no one appeared more startled than judge douglas himself he immediately came to my seat and courteously remonstrated against my amendment suggesting that the bill which he had introduced was almost in the words of the territorial acts for the organization of utah and new mexico that they being a part of the compromise measures of eighteen fifty he had hoped that i a known and zealous friend of the wise and patriotic adjustment which had taken place would not be inclined to do anything to call that adjustment in question or weaken it before the country i replied that it was precisely because i had been and was a firm and zealous friend of the compromise of eighteen fifty that i felt bound to persist in the movement which i had originated that i was well satisfied with the missouri restriction if not expressly repealed would continue to operate in the territory to which it had been applied thus negativing the great and salutary principle of non-intervention which constituted the most prominent and essential feature of the plan of settlement of eighteen fifty we talked for some time amicably and separated some days afterwards judge douglas came to my lodgings whilst i was confined by physical indisposition and urged me to get up and take a ride with him in his carriage i accepted his invitation and rode out with him during our short excursion we talked on the subject of my proposed amendment and judge douglas to my high gratification proposed to me that i should allow him to take charge of the amendment and engraft it on his territorial bill i acceded to the proposition at once whereupon a most interesting interchange occurred between us on this occasion judge douglas spoke to me in substance thus i have become perfectly satisfied that it is my duty as a fair-minded national statesman to cooperate with you as proposed in securing the repeal of the missouri compromise restriction it is due to the south it is due to the constitution heretofore palpably infracted it is due to that character for consistency which i have heretofore labored to maintain 
the repeal if we can effect it will produce much stir and commotion in the free states of the union for a season i shall be assailed by demagogues and fanatics there without stint or moderation every opprobrious epithet will be applied to me i shall be probably hung in effigy in many places it is more than probable that i may become permanently odious among those whose friendship and esteem i have heretofore possessed this proceeding may end my political career but acting under the sense of the duty which animates me i am prepared to make the sacrifice i will do it he spoke in the most earnest and touching manner and i confess that i was deeply affected i said to him in reply sir i once recognized you as a demagogue a mere party manager selfish and intriguing i now find you a warm-hearted and sterling patriot go forward in the pathway of duty as you propose and though all the world desert you i never will Unquote. footnote archibald dixon to h s foot october first eighteen fifty eight louisville democrat of october third eighteen fifty eight and footnote such is the circumstantial record of this remarkable political transaction left by two prominent and principal instigators and never denied nor repudiated by the third gradually as the plot was developed the agreement embraced the leading elements of the democratic party in congress reinforced by a majority of the whig leaders from the slave states a day or two before the final introduction of the repeal douglas and others held an interview with president pierce and obtained from him in writing an agreement to adopt the movement as an administration measure footnote jefferson davis who was a member of president pierce's cabinet secretary of war thus relates the incident quote, on sunday morning the twenty second of january eighteen fifty four gentlemen of each committee house and senate committees on territories called at my house and mr douglas chairman of the senate committee fully explained the proposed bill and stated their purpose to them through my aid to obtain an interview on that day with the president to ascertain whether the bill would meet his approbation the president was known to be rigidly opposed to the reception of visits on sunday for the discussion of any political subject but in this case it was urged as necessary in order to enable the committee to make their report the next day i went with them to the executive mansion and leaving them in the reception room sought the president in his private apartments and explained to him the occasion of the visit he thereupon met the gentlemen patiently listened to the reading of the bill and their explanations of it decided that it rested upon sound constitutional principles and recognized in it only a return to that rule which had been infringed by the compromise of eighteen twenty and the restoration of which had been foreshadowed by the legislation of eighteen fifty this bill was not therefore as has been improperly asserted a measure inspired by mr pierce or any of his cabinet unquote. from davis rise and fall of the confederate government volume one page twenty eight and footnote fortified with this important adhesion douglas took the fatal plunge and on january twenty third introduced his third nebraska bill organizing two territories instead of one and declaring the missouri compromise inoperative but the amendment monstrous caliban of legislation as it was needed to be still further licked into shape to satisfy the designs of the south and appease the alarmed conscience of the north two weeks later after the first outburst of debate the following phraseology was substituted quote, which being inconsistent with the principle of non-intervention by congress with slavery in the states and territories as recognized by the legislation of eighteen fifty commonly called the compromise measures is hereby declared inoperative and void it being the true intent and meaning of this act not to legislate slavery into any territory or state nor to exclude it therefrom but to leave the people thereof perfectly free to form and regulate their domestic institutions in their own way subject only to the constitution unquote. a change which benton truthfully characterized as quote, a stump speech injected into the belly of the nebraska bill Unquote. 
footnote we have the authority of ex-vice president hannibal hamlin for stating that mr douglas who was on specially intimate terms with him told him that the language of the final amendment to the kansas nebraska bill repealing the missouri compromise was written by president franklin pierce douglas was apprehensive that the president would withdraw or withhold from him a full and undivided administration support and told mr hamlin that he intended to get from him something in black and white which would hold him a day or two afterwards douglas in a confidential conversation showed mr hamlin the draft of the amendment in mr pierce's own handwriting and footnote the storm of agitation which this measure aroused dwarfed all former ones in depth and intensity the south was nearly united in its behalf the north sadly divided in opposition against protest and appeal under legislative whip and spur with the tempting smiles and patronage of the administration after nearly a four months parliamentary struggle the plighted faith of a generation was violated and the repealing act passed mainly by the great influence and example of douglas who had only five years before so fittingly described the missouri compromise as being quote, akin to the constitution unquote, and quote, canonized in the hearts of the american people as a sacred thing which no ruthless hand would ever be reckless enough to disturb unquote. End of section 19. Recording by Nathan Dickey, Ashland, Oregon.